community. And it's very good because We also have the issue of business. We know that all businesses have been disrupted. Perhaps technology is one of those businesses um, that have boomed and have grown during, um, during this pandemic. And the pandemic punctuates the business environment right now. It's, it's, um, it's, it's one constant thing that is over our lives, whether it comes to uh, issues of health, business, social, family, marriage life recreation it has influenced everything so you find that uh, silently during this kenya photo week as a photographers association we cannot ignore the fact that we're in the middle of a pandemic a lot of things have been disrupted a lot of been, things have been brought to a halt so we have to think we have to think about the new angle of approaching business as photographers so at this stage, um, it is important that uh, we look at uh, that issue of business, which will be the main topic this afternoon with a very good experience set of panels. The other is the Photography Association. Uh, personally, I have been at the leadership of the association for, I think, close to nine, 10 years now. And um, I, I saw something the other day that said, a good dancer knows when to exit the stage. But I think I want to do that at a time when we will give people an opportunity to try and put some efforts to bring back the association to what it used to be. We know there are a lot of problems. People are broke. Some people have left the photography work and they are doing other things. Some people are doubling between photography and other things. So we want to take time during the evening fireside chats to have a look at um, the welfare, or do I say the well-being? and the health, the corporate health of our association. Uh, we are also going to have a few so practical sessions. Um, the practical sessions will be uh, to help us to, 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 to deal with um, um, those who may want to learn something. Then, um, we have other specialized sessions. We have each sessions like nature and wildlife photography, documentary photography and storytelling, uh, nature conservation and wildlife. We have editing and retouch. We have uh, Paul Shinsky taking us through product and commercial photography. Uh, we have a very important session on Thursday about pricing photography. We always find especially both beginners and the professionals uh having challenges um having challenges with with um uh, pricing their work so we are looking forward to having a very important session and without taking much ado let me say thank you very much rahim and uh, genevieve and who will be joining us later also uh, dr betty Mwiti, to take us and set the pace in terms of um in terms of how we want to approach photography moving forward so rahim um we are very glad that you could uh, you could join us and um him better um so that i can share with you um uh steve a warning would have been nice i've been fiddling with my keyboard this whole time <laughs> what warning no just hold on <laughs> i just want to let people just let people know that uh, rahim is a kenyan photographer uh, currently based in Belgium and cinematographer and digital artist. He has um, an affinity. Did you want to use that word, Rahim, because you also love the affinity software? You know, I am, I'm wondering uh, because, you know, <laughs> I know you like using uh, the affinity software. So he has an affinity and passion for nature and wildlife. In his almost 25 years of uh, digital creative, as a digital creative, he's garnered certification with Adobe, uh, Apple, Phase One uh, as a 
expert. So Rahim is gonna be giving us global perspectives, uh, especially for us as content creators. And I believe continuously in this uh, Kenya Photo Week 2021, we will be talking about photographers as content creators, because I believe uh, we all know that that is where uh, the this, this space is headed. And later on, we're gonna have Dr. Mwiti, and then Genevieve, uh, we know we'll do the last presentation. So over to you, Rahim, the floor is yours. The next 20, 30 minutes, Asante. Hello, everyone. Uh, just a minute while I get my presentation on screen. Just as a note, this is more of a slideshow than an actual presentation. Um, I wanted to tackle a couple of matters that I've uh, that I believe I've noticed over the past six years um, that I think are crucial for the development, perhaps in Eastern, Central, and maybe even Sub-Saharan Africa in general. Um, the topic global perspectives on content creation for me was uh, a matter of trying to evaluate the current situation of content creation globally uh, from my perspective and um, also to help sort of disperse the information that I seem to have withheld over the past year generally, year and a half uh, since the pandemic began. Sorry, I'm, I'm going to ask that uh, PAK Studio to just mute their, their computer because there's, there's feedback coming back. A year and a half uh, since the pandemic began. Sorry, I'm, I'm going to ask that uh, PAK Studio to mute I'm going to ask that uh, PAK Studio to mute their, their computer because there's, there's feedback coming back. Steve? Thank you. Um, getting back to what I was saying, uh, the the perspective of understanding content creation and uh, in this respect, the consumption of content today. Um, traditionally, big screens like cinemas or even on televisions and billboards were what we used to use, even newspapers and posters and flyers to create um, advertisements and create awareness of, um, of content for consumption. This shift from traditional to now a digital system where we're looking at almost everyone being on social media or a large amount of the population being on social media is changing the perspective of how traditional companies would be using that this as advertising um, as an advertising platform. There has been a large evolution from actual consumption of media in our world today. There we go. In in my point, in my perspective, there's been a paradigm shift in the way media is now consumed versus how media used to be consumed. Um, the old marketing habits no longer apply to us. The advertisements that used to last 30 seconds to 45 seconds are now shifting to a five second advertisement on YouTube. In the digital space, advertisements that were traditionally created for mass consumption on a medium that you could not control like a television with analog signals is now becoming a matter of you have to be able to change your entire mindset to reach a, a, a demographic that no longer wants to sit in front of a screen watching an advertisement for more than 30 seconds. 
I like to look at uh, various social medias as uh, channels for myself to obtain different kinds of uh, information. This is a statistic or these are statistics that I got off the internet uh, of a couple of websites. I'm happy to share the, the websites that I got the information from. Uh, as you can see, this is specific to Kenya. So uh, let's, uh, le I'm, I'm sticking to that just so that it becomes a little more localized and a little more understandable as to where we sit with statistics. I may have gotten the statistics wrong, so please don't harangue me for this or don't hang me for it. Uh, but as you can see, 57.94% of our, our population uses Facebook for marketing, for advertising, for general social media usage. We know we have a strong presence on, on Twitter with Kenyans on Twitter. Instagram has 10.38%, YouTube 7.4%. Pinterest 5.87, and I did not know Tumblr still exists, 0.8%. Um, as of 2019 and 2020, the average daily social media usage of internet users worldwide, now this is a general global statistic, it is not a Kenyan statistic, amounted about 145 minutes per day from 142 minutes in the previous year. This means that we're spending, individuals are spending up to 145 minutes a day on social media. That's not a small statistic to look at. It's for me, it becomes a matter of, you know, I, I use Twitter, for example, for finding out what's happening in Kenya, keeping up to date with what's happening at home. Um, I use Facebook for finding out what's happening with my friends. Instagram is for art and for my creatives. And it's also where I post my work. Uh, YouTube is where I go and watch news if I need to, or if I need to just entertain myself. Instagram is also where I go to just decompress and I watch my evenings. I'm spending about an hour myself in front of the phone, just flipping away at Instagram videos. So the way we consume media is, is an interesting uh, phenomenon now. The younger generation may not understand it as much, but uh, I read something on Twitter yesterday, for example, where someone is saying, uh, until you're 30, if you're a new graduate, do not buy a television set. I responded with, I'm almost 40 and I still don't have a television set at home. Um, and I call it a television set because that's what we used to call it back in the day. Oh, sorry, I think I missed a slide. There we go. Um, so one of the other statistics I picked up was that 4.6 billion internet users globally and 4.2 billion social media users globally the value of the internet is indescribable today. This is one giant distribution network for creatives. It is, um, you know, our aim should be as content creators to not just create, not just create unique pieces that represent ourselves and our culture based on your own views, but also to earn an income. And I, I use this, uh, this particular phrase of earning an income more and more and more because I strongly believe as creatives, we, and more than likely currently as photographers, we tend to undermine our value as ourselves, as individuals, as creatives, as, as experts, because of the, the value that society has given us, which is, you know, so a paparazzi, you just come and take a couple of pictures and that's that. Uh, so it is important for us to understand that as a concept and generally uh, probably even just my perspective is that you should embed that into your ethos. Um, I wanted to share the world's most used social platforms according to Hootsuite, Hootsuite, Hootsuite. And we still have, we see that Facebook is still the largest con uh, distribution network in the world. Um, this is just information for you to understand where we're headed and where we're coming from. The television set is no longer the, the king when it comes to distribution. Hollywood is no longer the, you know, the go-to for films and production. It's now Netflix. Things are changing. There is a giant shift in the way we work and we should be working. Steve Jobs said there is a 
there is just a tremendous amount of craftsmanship in between a great idea and a great product. What does this mean? We've all heard that sentiment that, uh, you know, when as a photographer, we normally hear this word, the guys will come up to us after we've taken pictures and some random person will show up and say, boss, that, that camera, you know, it must be taking some amazing pictures or that camera takes some amazing pictures. Um, the viewer of the image, unless they've actually been involved in a production process, 90% of the time thinks, rarely thinks about the, the time put into creating the work that's being put out in front of them. And I believe there's there's two main reasons for this. The first is overconsumption of content. There has been an explosive amount of media to consume uh, around the world. This is why the statistics came in handy for me a little earlier to explain how much information is being consumed by us globally and locally for that matter. There has been a tremendous, tremendous, tremendous amount of information being put out there. Content is being created at an alarming rate on a daily basis. For people to be able to consume 145 minutes worth of content daily, the amount of content that must be out there on all the social media platforms we saw must be tremendous. The second concept or the second reason I believe that people don't think about the amount of time spent by a creative in creating uh, a particular piece of work is ignorance. Most people don't understand that in order to know how to set lights, in order to know where to put the reflector, in order to know how to remove shadows from under the eyes, how to avoid the flicker that I'm currently getting on my face through Zoom, there has got to be a certain amount of time spent, a certain amount of resources spent, a certain amount of experience gained in years, days, months, decades to achieve that level of perfection. And that is a matter of ignorance. It is not a matter of not wanting to know. It is a matter of not knowing because there is no information out there as to how much time a photographer takes in perfecting their craft. But why am I bringing this up in a topic of global perspectives on content creation? Uh, what does consumption or overconsumption and ignorance have to do with global content creation? Absolutely everything. Oh, let's go back. Absolutely everything. Everything and I mean this in a loose and a hard um, way, because if people don't understand how much time you're taking in putting things together, and if there is no knowledge and there's no information out there, you're going to keep hitting your head against a wall. Um, I know I skipped over this initially, and I did it for a reason. The reason was to introduce the topic and then introduce myself. As Steve mentioned, my name is Rahim. Um, I am also fondly known as Mudfish by individuals like Larry Sego and uh, Eric Kambati and Steve himself. In uh, social platform or on social platforms, I'm also known as the Nomadic Kenyan. And uh, I am a creative. I have been a creative since 1995, um, or maybe even earlier. Uh, being given the honor of opening a keynote is a privilege, and I hope to live up to it with this presentation or this speech. Some history on myself and perhaps the explanation as to why I chose my keynote address uh, or keynote address this topic as it is today. I've worked as a creative since 1995. And by that, I mean, in 1995, I started creating websites. Um, they may not have been as complex as they are today, but it required a certain amount of uh, creative knowledge and technical knowledge. 
And the creative knowledge for me started at that point with uh, an application called GIF Animator or GIF Animator, if you like to call it that. And it's uh, now probably non-existent, but in 19, 1995, it was all the hype about, you know, how you create uh, an animated text banner on a website. And it would be a static website with this banner on the page that is flickering or is sending a message like, hello, my name is Raheem. And that would have been the animation, but you'd be paying uh, top dollar for something like that. It's also the same year that I started with uh, Adobe Photoshop version 2.0. The concept of layers at that point was non-existent. So you make a mistake and it's like uh, Microsoft Paint, you're erasing it and starting over. Uh, in the span of 26 years, I've been employed by and uh, I've been employed by consulted for as well as created content for brands such as Serena, Sarova, Safaricom, Microsoft, Apple, and Adobe. Over the past six years, I've been traveling the world uh, for and with an NGO called the Aga Khan Development Network. I work with them under various capacities. I am a video editor, a photographer, um, a digital artist, a visual effects and 3D modeler slash animator, um, a media management expert and a technical supervisor. Now, these are all roles uh, that I have worked in previous capacities in and am now employing and utilizing to create and work with for them. I currently reside in Brussels and I've been here since November last year. And uh, why is that relevant? Oh, I missed a slide there. Because I believe that my unique perspectives on content creation as a creative, as well as my experience over the past 26 years adds value to what I'm about to share with you. The first note that I would like to take or I would like to present is let your best work represent you. From everything I've seen around uh, the world or with the creatives around the world that I have met and worked and collaborated with, the one most unique facet that I found with them compared to what I've seen within our circles is they don't post or they don't share anything that they don't believe is worth their value. So I would like to start by first saying, let your best work represent you. That means on any platform that you present, start with your very best work and only showcase your very best work. Okay, build yourself up as a brand, but not just as a brand, as a creative, but not just as a creative, as a creative in society, as a creative by himself or herself, and as a brand, but not just as a brand. The creative by himself is nothing if he or she has no market. If you're just a creative for the sake of being a creative, you're a hobbyist. If you're a creative for the sake of being a professional and you have no market, then you're just an artist. Now, the crux of everything I believe at the moment with perspectives on content creation globally and any form of art or content being created for me is art is subjective. Art is also cultural. It's personal, it's unique, but most of all, and I cannot emphasize this enough, most of all, art is subjective. This is not a new concept for anyone to understand. Art is a subjective, completely subjective concept, which means, and which I, I think may be difficult for a lot of people to understand, but which means that 
your relevance today may not be your relevance tomorrow. If you're popular today, you may not be popular tomorrow. Your content may be consumed well today, but may not be consumed well tomorrow. All of this boils down to very many things, but the key concept for me here is the subjectivity of art is you and your market. If you're not relevant today, you're not relevant. You're not gonna be relevant. The, the way times are shifting, the way content is being consumed, the way we're generating content at an exponential rate, if you have not been, if you don't have any clout on social media, if you don't have any clout on any form of media at the moment, you are not relevant. You do not have a market in the global perspective. Start building your market, start building your cloud. If you start today, you start today, you start now. And that means that in the next three to five years is when you will start to see changes and you will start to see a difference. It is not an immediate change. There are ways to make it happen, but that means that you've got to have resources at your disposal, which as a starting artist, most people don't have. So keep it in mind. I know my time is short. I know, uh, I think Steve's come back on like to tell me that my time is short. Um, and I've tried to, to keep my, uh, my presentation as succinct as possible. Um, it is very, very critical, very important to understand that Art creation is all subjective and your relevance in the current market is all based on your cloud and your availability as a, or your, yeah, it's all based on your cloud, sorry. Don't mean to beat around the bush or be confusing. There are two more points that I would like to make. The very first is for everyone to understand, and this is a myth, a myth I would like to debunk. This is something that has been plaguing uh, creatives in our region for a very long time and with creatives currently like uh, Osborne Masharia, Mutua Madeka, Masharia, David Masharia, um, Okaka, Felix, and a number of, number of others, uh, large, very, very many, very, very many creatives in Kenyan space. And I'm not talking about an international space, I'm talking about Kenyan space. Kenyan photographers that I know of are changing the perspectives, but slowly. And the reason I want to bring this up right now be is because I believe that our content is being influenced by this myth. And the myth is that uh, there's no such thing. It is very important for you to understand that today you have got to build your own um, myth. You've got to build your own concept. Yes, you watch YouTube videos by professionals and alleged professionals around the world who are apparently in the top of their games because these are the people putting out the content. These are the people who are showing the world that, okay, I can do this. Doesn't mean that you can't do it. It just means that they are the first to show you that they can do it.
expression on his face. You know, this is a pause and reflect. Like you, you now enter into his mind and you begin to imagine what he's thinking about. You begin to construct a narrative around his countenance. So when we are choosing photography for publication, these are some of the elements that we look at. And above all, it should tie to the theme or to the concept of your story or layout. This is something that I worked on in 2013. Uh, the CEO was, the then CEO for KQ, Titus Naikuni. He had come to the end of his tenure and now they were looking for a replacement. And this was totally the photographer's idea and concept. And when she brought back the photos was taken by Liz Mothoni, when she used to work at Nation, she's now somewhere else. And um, when she brought the photo, it totally worked with the layout that we had. It was her concept, it was her idea. But when she brought it to me, I saw what she was thinking and I didn't need to make any other adjustments. All I had to do was to make this photo sit on the page and add my little design to it, yeah? So when we are working together and collaborating, again, it was mentioned in the earlier presentation. I know as creatives, we are very, what's the word? We really believe in what we do. And sometimes we are high on our own supply. So you feel that the way you have thought about something is the way you're going to execute it. It doesn't matter how other people will need to use your work. For you, you have uh, identified your particular style and you want to stick to it because you're a brand and that's how your work goes. But if your work is going to be consumed on different platforms, sometimes it is good to give some elbow room so that other people can also uh, request for how they would want that work presented. So if you have a particular style of shooting, you know, maybe that style would not work for a spread. Maybe you like doing close-ups, you know, and when you do a close-up photo and now you distribute that to be used on print, especially, you know, on, on digital, it could work. But on print, we have to consider where we're going to put the text, how it's going to sit on the page. So we find it a bit limiting. So you may still have to give different options of that particular shot so that the people who are the secondary users of this uh, photo may also be able to build content around it. And Again, as we are looking at collaboration, yes, you may have your own following, but it's good also to build on the following of other people so that you can increase your impact, yeah? So when you're composing the photo, check the style and also see how your style complements the secondary user, in this case, the designer, how that style will impact their work. Also the tone, maybe, the type of camera you're using. I've had an experience, okay, I'm not a photographer myself, but I've seen um, how Canon produces and how Nikon produces. And I tend to lean towards Canon because of the colors. I don't know, again, it's a matter of preference, but sometimes we are brought for handout photos and the color, the tone of the photo, it has not been properly edited or it was not taken with the proper lighting. So we just use it because perhaps that's the only photo, especially maybe if it's a personality story. So you cannot get stock photography or you cannot just have text. You have to use this photo, but you can see the tone color is a mess. Again, clarity, this just goes to show the settings and everything, yeah? Because I'm sure the, in, this, in this meeting, they are beginners, they are, professionals. So those are just things, these are just some of the things that uh, we consider when you're working as a team. Negative space, again, what I said before, 
if you're cropping your photos so tightly. It makes it hard for the designer to work or add other elements to it. The rule of thirds. I have examples here. These were covers that I've done for this magazine on different uh, on different days. Yeah, in 2020. This is a stock image. The one on the left is a stock image. The one on the right is an an image that was taken by our in-house photographer. So when I talk about the rule of thirds, I know. Most of us know the rule of that, where the photo, the, the element is leaning like towards the third, uh, the third square when you draw. Yeah. So for me, this particular uh, image, it's not that we don't have in-house golf pictures, but Whenever we are going to the archives to look for the in-house golf pictures, they are so far out because maybe sports photography, it, they look for the action, you know, they're looking for the action. And for us as designers, this is now something talking about golf tourism. So we want to emphasize just on the golf, uh, the golf implements and not really on the game because it will not have an impact if I was to put a golfer far, far into the photo and then now say this is about golf tourism. For me, I felt like the closer the image, again, this is personal preference. I felt like the closer the image, somebody can be able to relate and to make up the rest of the image to see what I'm communicating. Yeah. The one on the right, this was something we were doing a story about how the restaurants are taking a hit during this COVID pandemic. As you can see, there's nothing really wrong with this photo if it was being used inside the magazine. But for a cover, it is very busy. So I find like I'm layering elements on top of the other. There is a lot of crowding, but it's what I had to work with. So as, as I have said before, how we shoot, you know, the style, the tone, the, the color, all this has to do with composition so that the person who is going to use your photo in whichever platform, in whichever format, they'll be able to maneuver without affecting the quality, the clarity of the photo. Again, if this was just going on social media, it would not need all this extra text around it. So somebody would just see that, yes, the restaurants are empty, there, there are no customers. But now that it has to go to print, it's going with so many other layers. So I don't know how somebody views this photo, but as for me, I had to communicate something. But this is not my best work. But it serves as an example of how we feel limited sometimes as designers when we don't have much choice in the photos that are given to us. So the second thing again is photo integrity. Integrity is truthful and unaffected quality. And before Donald Trump, I didn't know that there was things like fake news or alternative facts, but these are words that now are part of our vocabulary in the media. And there's Every time I see a photo, especially on WhatsApp, immediately my mind just flags it as fake, 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 because I know that there's a lot of technology available to adjust photos. And being in mainstream media, especially, this is something that we take very seriously. And I said the digital artists, perhaps then they are allowed leeway to recreate photos and give a certain, you know, give a certain view that us in mainstream media, we are not allowed because it really affects the perception of the news. This is an example I got online. This was done in 2011. On the right, we have the original photo. Then on the left, we have the edited photo. 
Now, the people at Grazia, they say that, you know, they really wanted this dress to be on its own and there was no photo in the wedding that she was alone. So I don't know whether this is what this was what the photographer did or this is what or this was what the designer did. But at the end of the day, we have an altered photo, which is a total misrepresentation of what was actually happening on that day. Mark Twain said that never let the truth get in the way of a good story. And sometimes as creative, this is how we feel. You have very little wiggle room to work with. So you decide to use your creativity to recreate how it was supposed to be. And so we, we, we have a lot of altering, a lot of manipulation so that you can skew the story in a certain way. And you, this affects perception of the public and your credibility at the end of the day. So I have other examples. Again, these are just global examples. This is Lupita Nyong'o with two different tones. Uh, this one was done by Vanity Fair. She did not, Lupita did not complain about this photo. She endorsed it. And Vanity Fair, they claim that they did not alter her photo. But we can see that these are photos that have been taken on two different occasions, and she has two different tones. So visual integrity as a photographer, as a creative. This is something that in mainstream media, we are very careful about. And the integrity of the photo, it relies on the photographer. You know, do you want to be known as that person person who cannot be trusted, that person who over embellishes, that person who can be, is very pliable and malleable that, you know, your photos actually work on water, literally, like you can make someone do, you know, whatever, that your photos don't represent what happened in the actual scenario. And I'm quoting somebody called Campbell that pictures are considered to be altered when it involves addition of elements in the picture or if it involves subtraction of elements that are supposed to be in the picture. So fine, these people, they got what they wanted. They got how they wanted the Duchess to look like, but it's all a lie. It's all a lie. So what's the point? Did they allow their integrity to be compromised just so they can get a good story? They wanted to see the whole Alexander McQueen dress. But at the end of the day, they ended up even making her look slimmer than she is, which is a total misrepresentation of somebody without their consent just for the sake of your story. Another example with the same, same magazine, they're notorious for that, that they cropped out her hair. And I don't know, maybe they were saying that uh, she, in her view, she was saying, they were saying it should, it should fit into a Eurocentric view of beauty. As a designer, perhaps I'm thinking the only reason I'd be tempted to do this is so that this uh, text could fit without uh, being interfered with by the hair. But then again, it goes to what I was saying, like your photo composition needs to put into consideration where is this picture going to be used? In how many formats is it going to be used? Are there different angles that I can take so that the designer feels comfortable and does not get the temptation to alter the images and misrepresent the subject? So integrity in photography, it involves trust and responsibility. And this is important so that we can gain the trustworthiness. And we have seen in this example that this adjustments this could have been done at the design stage this probably was um, a lighting issue or it would have been done at the design stage this was definitely done <laughs> at the design stage at the consent of the photographer i don't know but the integrity is for both creatives 
Yeah, because sometimes as a photographer, you will give out your image and then the designer takes the creative license and makes yes. something totally different. So both the designer and the photographer are responsible to channel the right information to the audience through visual communication. This is just something I picked up from the net. This is an image I got from Jumia. Again, we can see this is the same dress, the same angle, the same fold, but different colors. So as a consumer, yes, you are showing me the variety of uh, stock that you have. But I am always asking myself, is it the exact color? I order so many things online, but sometimes when it comes, because this was digitally altered, I feel deceived, I feel misled. So yes, perhaps you're saving on cost or the client is saving on cost and they tell you, okay, fine, just take one and then we'll alter all of them, you know, to, to suit the colors that we have. But the client gets disappointed because the commodity that we are selling online is trust. What we are buying online is trust. So. You know, somebody is not comfortable trusting you or following your work because they are not sure what they're getting. Yeah. Trust is the most treasured commodity in the digital space. And where there is low trust between designer and photographer, everything takes more time, more money, and creates more stress. So my parting shot is that let's have a clear brief. If you are doing a collaboration, let's have a clear brief. Let's plan in advance. Let's be able to pivot. I know the creatives, the designer has their own concept. The photographer has their own style. But when we come together, let's be able to pivot so that we can have successful projects. And lastly, full disclosure. This is, again, something that we have experienced and some has resulted in legal action. Because sometimes the photographer will uh, shoot a photo of a particular person. Let's say this is a celebrity. And then you give the photo to the to the client. The client gives the photo to us. We don't know that you still, as a photographer, you still have rights to these photos. So we publish the photo because we were given by the client, only for us to get a fee note from the photographer that we owe them money. So you see, we don't have, when we're getting these handout photos or when you're giving your client the photos, if you still have rights to that photo, make sure that you let us know or that you let the client know so that when we have been given a photo to use for our one-off stories, we will be prepared for the outcome. Some photos have cropping limitations. I hear like photos for Picasso, Picasso photos, the paintings, they, they cannot be cropped or something like that. So there are some photos that have limitations. So if there is full disclosure, we'll be able to know so that we don't fall into the trouble of third party liabilities. You have used a photo probably on your social media, on your website or on a publication, and then you end up with a legal suit because the photographer has rights and they have been violated. So always stay ready. This is a photo that went viral some time back. And this photographer, when he was explaining, he said, actually this day, he felt like it wasn't his day. He was really fumbling with his stuff, but somehow he came up with this photo. He didn't have all these things. He didn't plan in advance, people, whatever. He just was at the right place at the right time and he captured the moment. So thank you very much. I'm happy to be part of uh, the bigger discussion. My work can be found on my website, www.v360.com. Thank you, Park. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, everyone, for your time. Thank you. Good day. Steve? Yes, thank you very much. Um,
uh, Genevieve, Asante Sana. Um, you're in the car now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Are you in traffic? Let's not get into trouble. <laughs> uh, no, 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 no. I'm not, and I'm not the one driving. So, um, oh, okay. Good. it's a Monday morning, so I'm balancing a number of things. Asante Sana, Genevieve, um, for giving us a different uh, perspective. Um, I think those of us who are following uh, this second presentation, uh, you're able to tell the how wide our scope as photographers, as content creators should be. Um, it is also giving us uh, a little bit of an insider perspective, uh, especially on the publishing space. Uh, having worked at a newspaper before, when I hear you mention people bring pictures and then later on people claim they want to be paid. Yeah. Um, we encountered that even from this side as a photographer, the many times in being in the PAK leadership that I've had people say, our hey, watu a nation, walitumia picha yangu, watu a standard, wametumia picha yangu, hata hawalipi, hata subject haku niambia. There are a lot of things that we need to understand and perhaps like Rahim talked about collaborations, seek more conversations to make sure that there are clear lines of communication, even with an institution like NMG or Standard Group and other magazine publishers, uh, even bloggers. You know, we have event photographers having their pictures being used, and they are like, hey. you know, there was a famous picture of uh, the lady with low fat Kasarani during the Uhuru swearing in. Your picture is trend, you know, there are a lot of things that we need to be aware of. And of course, I hope that you have uh, shed some good light on uh, the designer's perspective, the creative's perspective in terms of composition, where will the picture be used, giving some um, flexibility and different pictures for different uses. Uh, I think that was very, very insightful. I'm sure there'll be some comments and questions as we finish up. Uh, we have two keynote presentations down, uh, Rahim Asante, Genevieve Asante Sana. So we have uh, Dr. Karimi Mwiti, are you there? Hi, Steve, yes, I'm here. Okay, great, great. Um, so I think the floor is yours. Um, again, we have uh, this time a little bit from an academic angle, although I know Dr. Mweti is a, not so much of an academician, <laughs> but more of a good understanding of both the, 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 the learning environment and the business environment. I think you bring in a good balance of both. So uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Mweti is actually at Nairobi. Uh, formerly School of Arts and Design called Department of Art Design. And um, she has supervised and lectured both undergrad and postgrad. And she's very keen on things like design thinking, design methodology, visual communication. And she has handled a lot of projects. And I'm sure some of those things are going to pop up as she does her presentation. So Dr. Muti, you have your next 20, 25, at most 30 minutes. And then after that, we are going to come in with comments and questions from those who are following the event online. So, Wanja Niwako, Karibu. All right. Thank you so much, Steve. Um, I think you've, you've, uh, you've overblown my CV, but um, yeah. more or less, <laughs> that's what I do. Uh, my name is, uh, some people call me Betty, others call me Karimi, others call me Dr. Miti. All of them are my names. And that's, it's a pleasure being with you here this morning. Um, you'll allow me to share my screen as I just talk more about what I do. <laughs> yes, so as uh, Steve rightfully put it, I have lectured at the University of Nairobi for about, uh, I think I'm going to my 12th year now. Previously, I, I, I trained my undergraduate as a designer, graphic designer, the same with my master's. And then my PhD saw me going into public health, but I had to integrate my design background and I ended up doing um, a study within one of the informal settlements in Nairobi on public health and more specifically health communication. And I looked at how lifestyle diseases can be, um, let me call it promoted or health promotion programs that are being run in informal settlements, of course, with a background of uh, health 
and communication integrated. Um, so I was told to talk about how photography can do storytelling. And as I've, as I've mentioned, I've done a lot of research and I've used photography a lot. I am not a professional photographer, but I have worked with professional photographers. I would call myself a social photographer. I do it as a hobby. So once in a while, I look at the different angles as I generally talked about the lighting, the camera that you use and Rahim as well. So just to talk about, I'll just show you how Photography works very well in terms of storytelling. I will just use an example of one of the research programs I've been uh, involved with. I've done about three so far, and I'll talk about the most recent one, uh, where uh, I got a grant together with a research team. We worked on how political cartooning can help um, um, fight post-election conflicts. And in particular, I used the case study of the 2007, 2008 post-election violence. My study area was in Madare. So that was me fitting into the setting that, in that particular setting. Um, just an introduction uh, of what, how I feel photography can be used in terms of uh, different aspects. So photographs sometimes tell a story better. Um, it's been said a picture is not worth more than a thousand words. So it's sometimes a story uh, is better than words alone. And then pictures and about emotion, they entertain, they educate, they disturb. Of course, they cause some sort of um, uh, persuasion. They will just elicit some emotion of some sort. Again, photography allows an individual the ability to communicate small moments in time. So we are talking about capturing still moments and we're talking about capturing emotions, we're talking about capturing just an activity or an event that can be felt and or experienced. And then of course, photography has the ability to change the manner in which people see and view the world. How you as a photographer will capture moments can also be interpreted in different ways by different eyes, by different um, uh, people, by different uh, situations and the like. Um, so I talked about the still moment. Of course, we're talking about here, we're talking about still images, not um, like detailed, like videos or the like. We're talking about a still image, one that freezes time forever in a powerfully arresting moment. So as you can see illustrated there, that's, uh, and I'll talk about it as we progress. Uh, that's one of the images that I captured uh, on site where we did um, in Madare, where we're talking to different uh, youth in that particular setting about how the translate political cartooning or how they feel that cartoons can assist in trying to mitigate the different uh, social challenges that they may have in that particular setting. Um, of course, it was more about an illustration uh, workshop and we did a bit of design thinking, but the moments that we captured in terms of photography brought out the kind of uh, emotion this particular youth felt. And these still moments also are what helped us in terms of putting together a report to now give back to the funder and um, of course, sharing some of these images with just a wider setting now makes you feel like you're actually in there with the, with the particular um, participants. And that's why I said the importance of the still image is you want the viewer to share your feeling when you are there and how in the setting was in particular. And then, of course, uniquely seeing and perceiving. So you just don't go and take photographs just for the sake of it. Of course, there's that that you're doing um, snapshots where you have them for Instagram or Facebook and any other social media platform. But in this particular one, there's a story and a message that you want to pass across. So you have to have a unique um, angle and a unique eye so that you can now bring out a unique uh, perception of this particular event. So which again, of course, results in effective communication with just a view of the world through the lens of a camera, the importance of just capturing the still moment. Um, I just delved more into what um, I did at that particular time with my research team and how these photographs and the eventual reporting process went. So what can photography do that words or other artistic media cannot do? This is one of, this is a, the photo here is one of the research team members. He was just, um, you know, internalizing the kind of illustrations that this particular youth, um, I'll mention that this particular center was called the Madari Social Justice Center. And this is where the youth are using art for social change. They look at um, illustrations, they do photography, they do um, creative arts, they do music, they do all types of, of art 
related things just to try and deal with the social challenges that they face. And this particular, as I talked, as I said, is a research that we are looking at just the particular cartooning and influence on post-election conflict within the youth. I will allow me to just um, uh, show you one of the presentations that we did. Um, please tell me, I hope this is clear. Uh, we, we did give credit to the photographers when we we're doing this presentation and just trying to tell you how photographs can now elicit a different kind of um, communication to a particular setting. Um, the grant, this is just how the application form was. In terms, of course, it's a very academic, it's very research-centered. So you just do a lot of write-up and a lot of research based on what the particular topic was. And the topic that we're working on for the grant was, we want a better tomorrow, a plea by the youth of Madare Valley, Nairobi, Kenya. So of course, all this is all literature related and, and a lot of um, background uh, study. We then ended up having to now do a presentation uh, to this particular group. This was funded by the University of Leicester in the UK. And this is also, of course, what adds value or marks to your presentation. Um, I believe the screen, the different um, windows I'm opening are visible. Someone have found? I believe so. So this is no, how we ended we're up- We're only seeing the PDF at the moment. Uh, just a PDF? Yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, let me share the whole screen and not just particular windows. I, this is now okay, the PDF. Yeah, I can see University of Leicester. Yes, okay. Um, just to go back uh, to what I was saying, so when I was applying for the grant, um, of course, we now become very academic, very research based, and you just write a whole write up where you now look at background literature, you look at background studies, and this ideally is how um, this was presented towards the, um, the research um, uh, people, the grants and the funding office. Um, but because we want to try and also create some sort of um, interest in terms of how you, you, you want to win this particular grant, we use the power of photography. So this is, um, of course, we give credit to the photography and the photographers of this particular presentation. And this, as I say, this was looking at the post-election uh, times and how the youth have been able to overcome such moments. And of course, the study is also looking at how we intend to now do use the youth to try and elect um, competent leaders. People will actually fight for them and avoid this kind of conflicts. Translating from just the PDF and the whole literature and written things, we now had to do a presentation towards um, to the funders, and we believed visual, as I said, words uh, versus picture cannot compare. So this is uh, some. This is just a gorgeous street. This is how we presented in terms of just a lot of more of photography of course accompanied by storytelling so you look at how the incidences were in 2007 2008 and you bring out a lot of emotive experiences through this um these are just some of the illustrations that were done the photos that were taken over the time um and then of course thereafter we also look at uh, we've done as i said and Derito said i do a lot of design thinking methodology and this is some of the things that we use when you're trying to reach out to grants and just showing and the funders showing that how some of these um activities are very engaging and the power of photography in trying to explain a situation versus trying to do a write-up is very different <clears throat> um so just having presentations purely based on photography can now create some sort of uh, interest in terms of your presentation, in terms of trying to reach a particular audience instead of trying to fill up the place with too much text. And then, of course, you'll always have a slide where now you, whatever is translated uh, comes back uh, in terms of um, a little text, but more of illustrations. And then um, this is now the final output in terms of trying to now tell the funder we want a better tomorrow. I play by the youth of Madare. So just to go back to the presentation, what can photography do that words or other artistic media cannot do? 
So once we now got the funding, we went on the ground. Um, of course, we had different teams. We had people teaching uh, design thinking methodology. We had a, we had someone take a repertoire who was doing the reporting. Then we had, of course, a team member who was also doing the data collection and analysis. But all these moments were captured. And as you can see at the top right here, this is where we had the session on the focus group discussion. We had it. Uh, we had this as a two two. Uh, part uh, sessions. So we had, of course, a pre uh, study and then a post study, but just having photography, just trying to explain to the different uh, audiences. So here we're looking at funders, we're looking at people who have interest in this kind of studies. We're looking at also data dissemination to the same um, uh, stakeholders, the same participants. I mean, they feel as part of the process when they're engaged in all this through photography. And we call this uh, photography for social justice. This was the part two series where now once we went on the ground and we told them what we expect in terms of political cartooning, in terms of what they want, the kind of emotions they want to bring out in terms of illustrations, in terms of photography, in terms of the art related um, media, they would sit down and then illustrate that. And this at the bottom right is some of the members now explaining how this uh, worked out for them. And then this is just something very of interest in that particular setting where within the Masdare Social Justice uh, Hall, where they, of course, they express their different, um, um, do I call it emotions and the different quotes that they, they, they feel just speaks to them in, in totality. Um, I'm sorry, I need to keep uh, doing this. I, so, this was the final report that we now gave once we finished the study. And as you can see, the power of photography on the right side here, um, this is just a photograph that was taken just from one of the, the top of the Madari social justice. And just the power of photography can now make you feel like you're actually present within the place. And then this, of course, was now a, 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 a similar illustration done, just seeing the translation of photos to illustration and vice versa. And then how you actually use photography to try and elicit a story in terms of um, just not a boring report, but just trying to make it of interest, to try and make the reader want to be, to, to engage more in this. You want to make the, um, the participant also feel like they were part of the study. Um, of course, uh, additional photos and combination of a lot of typography, just making the whole the whole uh, report look of it interesting. Again, just the power of of uh, photos storytelling. So this was the first session we had this, and we had of course um, the setting that has been talked about by both Rahim and Genevieve in terms of the capture of the photo and just the look and feel of how this comes out and the emotion that is elicited by the both, the, this is one of the facilitators. And then of course, just the interest captured in, by the people in attendance. Um, of course, these are all very similar photos. Um, again, the power of a photo. And this is the one they were now doing a creative bit of it. So what I'm trying to explain to this report, the, the essence of photography in terms of um, doing publications, in terms of reporting, in terms of just making a, a, a certain uh, publication or certain, uh, what do I call it? Uh, maybe it could be a, photo, a journal, a sort of um, anything that is written, trying to just use the power of photography in trying to do a storytelling thing to avoid uh, boredom. Um, I'll just go to skim through and I'm sure I'll be able to share this with the, uh, of course, these are some of the illustrations that came up after the whole event, the whole two series workshop. And now all we do, and we try a lot to avoid, to try and change the illustration. We just capture the photo. We, we either do a good photo or we do a scan and then just clean up in terms of brightening. Because the idea is that we're trying to just translate or put the emotion that the particular participants feel into this and without uh, changing or trying to do any interference in terms of the original work. Um, just like Genevieve said, in terms of editing to suit your needs, we avoid that a lot. And I think that brings out the, the real emotion, the real feel of how this particular um, group or study participants feel. Um, of course, some of the emotions that are shown there, this was the bigger team. Um, this is a, a lot of research uh, analysis, which is part of the study. Um, uh, 
Um, yes. So um, basically, what what I've just been trying to bring out is uh, looking at photography as a valid art form in different kinds of media. So we've talked about media can be used for advertising, um, media can be used for um, entertainment. Uh, in this particular way, I'm looking at photography being used as a reporting tool. Um, it can use it can be used to just make something of interest in terms of how you report. I've said I do a lot of research, but I've used photography for a long time in trying to just simplify um, a certain um, study. Uh, we'd, we, I avoid having something that's too academic, so I try to simplify it as much as I can for the layman. And just the power of photography can be of, of, uh, of a lot of interest. So I'm looking at uh, photography as a reported tool because it enables one to effectively communicate the ideas while promoting critical thinking. Just looking at that illustration there, um, or rather the photograph there of the young man doing an illustration, he had actually gone through a whole process of trying to understand how politics has affected the particular setting, how politics has made them have so much conflicts amongst themselves in the community. Um, it became tribal, it became religious as well. It was all a cultural setting. But you as a photographer want to just capture this moment and then share this particular moment with other viewers who are also would want to know. So instead of writing a whole um, thesis, let me call it a thesis, a whole um, newspaper article, a whole everything, just that photo captured as is, can now create a sense of uh, being there, a sense of being engaged with this particular person and within the particular setting. So reporting tools enables one to effectively communicate the ideas while promoting critical thinking. We also look at, at integrity and accountability. What I mean from this, and as Genevieve explained, is that you avoid having to edit or try to manipulates particular photos. So you look at bringing out the true issue of what really happened in the actual scenario. I know she mentioned truthful and unaffected, and that's what we mean by this part. We avoiding trying to edit to suit your particular needs. Of course, I know like in, in advertising and the like, um, I've previously called it deceptive advertising because it's a sort of marketing tool where we do a lot of airbrush of the models or probably the products on sale. But in this uh, setting, I advocate a lot for the, a photo being brought out as is the true issue of what has really happened. And then of course, um, I was looking at this, as I've said, as photography for social change. So we are looking at um, change maker, where every message from the image brings education to the mind of the viewers. Um, I shared that I showed you just snippets of the report before. So once we uh, finalize uh, one of these uh, reports, it has to be published, it's still with the University of Leicester. And as with other similar uh, research um, that we carry out, we end up having them published. And then of course they're shared with the wider audience. And in particular, we do a lot of data dissemination back to the community and participants that we've worked with. Again, the use of illustrations, the use of photography weighs heavily in some of these publications because you're trying to make it as simple as possible for, of course, um, the least, uh, let me call it the least cut in terms of education in, in along the, um, the study participants. So, of course, we have the top notch researchers, but you also have the middleman and then we have the last man in the whole line who needs to understand some of these things. And a photograph is as important in trying to just make this um, a very easy process to understand and to comprehend. So every message from the image brings education to the mind of the viewers and of course, brings out the positive implications to individuals and society. And um, I, yeah, I had very little to say, but for me, I think um, that was much more about how photography uh, works well for viewers for storytelling. Over to you, Ndaritu. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Betty Muti, for giving us that academic, not so academic um, <laughs> angle uh, as far as um, as far as uh, our perception of uh, photography is one of the powerful tools of visual communication is called sand. Um, so I think I uh, want to find out if there are people who may have questions or may want to make comments, including uh, the panelists themselves, uh, Mr. Rahim or uh, Genevieve, 
if you have any comments you'd like to make based on uh, the presentations by your fellow keynote speakers, uh, we want to appreciate um, want to appreciate those who have been uh, following us online, uh, Esther Jonde on YouTube, uh, Jefferson Yakamba, uh, Samia Kamali, uh, Miaron Billy, Brian Main, Collins Otieno, uh, Pigapix, I think I know the screen name, Pigapix. Uh, those who are following us also on uh, YouTube on the professional Kenyan photographers page. Asante Nisana. So if uh, we have any questions, um, you can, uh, it's a good time, you can type them on the chat section on both Facebook and on, and on uh, YouTube. And uh, the few of you who are here on the Zoom uh, meeting. Uh, Dr. Mwiti, thank you very much for giving us this perspective. Uh, it is very clear, um, it is very clear that uh, a broader understanding of the issues that we deal with and also the, the the advantage of using photography to break the monotony. I was looking at that uh, PDF you shared of uh, your project and I'm like, people don't have time to read a lot of these things. Of course, in the academic circles, there is no short, there is no shortcut. But then um, it was very good to that uh, some of you in the academic space are taking the the road less traveled and using things like photography, video, and other visual content to, to make a case uh, for whatever your research work is on. Um, any comments, Rahim, Genevieve? Any comments you may want to make? Uh, and the few of you who are here, Rahim, any comments so far? Yeah, uh, Genevieve, is it possible to go back to your slide, uh, slide 20 or slide 19, I think? Let me share the screen. Yeah. Is that 19? Was it? What was it about? Here, here we are. Yeah. Um, I, I am curious about uh, about this in in an academic perspective, Karimi. I know you 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 spoke about how uh, sorry the the impact you spoke about with uh, photography and art in a general perspective. I guess from my point of view, I I am not from my point of view. Sorry, I am very curious about what. Uh, um, what direction you feel we're headed in when the integrity is concerned, especially when it comes to art and um, uh, and photography, perhaps even uh, documenting or even journalistic reviews. Sorry, was the question addressed to me or to Genevieve? Uh, no, I wanted to use Genevieve's slide to, to ask you the question about uh, an academic perspective on integrity in current, uh, in current uh, content creation? Um, I think that's, a, a, do I call it a cash 22? Because as I've said, I've previously worked in advertising um, and how I came back to academia is uh, I came back to do my masters. And my masters was on, um, because of working so much in advertising, I used to do a lot of uh, what I said, the airbrushing and everything. And I just felt ethically, I think that was not right because especially, um, I'll not mention the brands that I worked for, but you would imagine like um, beauty products and you want to make this uh, lady look in particularly very, you know, um, glowy skin and everything. But you know, this person does not use that particular product. Um, surprisingly, I came back and did my masters and I did it in deceptive advertising. And uh, now ethically, I think that has really driven me to keep uh, looking at, of course, it's allowed that you want to clean up photos, uh, of course, lighting and the different things. But I, I have really pushed for, and I, I tell my own particular students that I think let's look at ethical photography in terms of um, what message are you portraying? Um, so in my research, I've also gone so much into that kind of uh, field of trying to just bring out a photo as is and not, not editing too much. Um, and the editing I'm talking about in this case would be just light cleaning in terms of the, um, 
you know, just small spots, but not really trying to do so much airbrush on, on something. So in terms of integrity, yes, I feel it's also personally driven. So as I'm saying, it was became a personal thing for me when I realized, okay, I think I'm really deceiving people. I did my thesis on, uh, in particular, on um, fresh, not fresh, fresh juices in the, in, the, in the Kenyan market where they say no preservatives, no added sugar, no. And it took me to a level where I actually, the biggest brands, I will not mention them now, but the biggest brands in, in the Kenyan market, surprisingly, I did even a, a lab test in one of our, um, uh, the labs in the university. Surprisingly, preservatives were quite high, sugar was quite high. And I said, wow, okay. Um, anyway, it's a thesis and, you know, you write their footnote. This is purely for academic purposes. But yeah, I feel it's very driven in terms of um, I try to encourage my students to be ethical about it, to look at the integrity behind it. But I think it's at a personal level where you choose which way that you go. I think I'm going to use that analogy in my future classes. Uh, Converting a photograph or editing a photograph is like adding preservatives and sugar to juice. Um, I, I think I've seen Steve might be a bit busy, so I think there's a, a question from Miarion. Oh, uh, oh, you're I here. Have okay. a I have okay. I have a question to Dr. Betty Rahim. Then you can go on. Eh? Rahim, you're there. I am here. Go on. Okay, Dr. Mwiti, there's a question from uh, uh, Miaron Billy. Says, thank you, Dr. Mwiti. This is actually the field I am in, documentary and storytelling. I have a question for you. How does a grant process application work? Let's say I want to collaborate with researchers on a project. Uh, maybe you can just give an overview of the, Pro, the grants and all that. I know it's because you're in the academic space and then Rahim, um, you can go on with the rest. There are a few questions on Facebook too. Thank you. All right, thanks, Steve. Um, that is a whole a whole lecture in terms of how to do the grant and, uh, and the application. Um, of course, there are so many grants and uh, research, research grants and fellowships that are also uh, all over the emails. The first step, of course, is to make sure you qualify. I mean, before you start writing the grant, you need to make sure you have the team to work with. You're able to be competent enough to complete the task uh, once uh, given the funding. So yes, this is a whole topic. I don't know how to, I think the overview is just, I think the first step is to try and make sure that you actually have the capacity and the ability to be able to um, undertake that particular grant. I always advise people, I'm not very, I'm not big in these grants just yet. I would say I am, Beginner level, no, not beginner, but I'm now on my third grant. But of course, you just start slow and start small. Don't apply for like a hundred M dollar grant when you, your capacity right now is fifty thousand USD, for example. Um, but I can share my email, I think, on chat or through you the ritual so that we can converse further in terms of how to apply for the grant uh, processes. Most, as you say, that are coming through uh, institutions. They are very, they are rare. Uh, grants that will give an individual because of course of the complexity of uh, people running away with money. That's very critical. I mean, you may be given the money and just disappear. That happens a lot. So they always try to make it either institutional based or you're doing it with an organization that has some validity. Uh, individual level might be a bit of a challenge. Um, what else? I think um, that's the most I can give you right for now, unless now we have a discourse in terms of how we take it up from a particular level. Thank you. I didn't. I didn't have any questions, Steve. I was actually just going to ask the same question that was on Facebook. Uh, while we wait for Steve, Genevieve. Yes, it's, it's okay. Craig. You can go ahead and read them on Facebook, Rahim. Just uh, uh, there aren't any more questions. I think that was that was the last one. Um, okay. That was the only one, actually. Okay. Uh, I don't see any other questions. Okay. So unless then, uh, someone else has a question, and I think we're uh, let me, we're okay. Let me just let me just look at a few of those uh, comments. Okay. Uh, we had a few people uh, on uh, Facebook. We had Mishak Marsh. Uh, 
Kagai Wamboy, we had Alex Maingi, uh, and Marion, we have asked the question, Daudi and Malama, Asante Sana. So I think, uh, Rahim, we can, we can uh, get at that. Um, the rest of the team, Asante Sana, Dr. Muti, um, uh, thank you for taking the time. Genevieve, Asante for taking the time. Rahim, all the way back to uh, Belgium. Najua time, I'm confused, Kidogo, time zone, Kidogo, plus, minus. There is too. Yes. I have a quick question. Uh, there's something Rahim said about uh, creating local content. And in my field, we use a lot of, we're still using a lot of stock photography, especially for the magazines because of the variety, the concept. And I know there was uh, a plan, a project to start a local stock image facility. I don't know as PAK Park, how far that has gone. Is that resource available or is it uh, still in the pipeline to be something that designers locally can benefit? Because again, when you look at most of our publications, uh, newspapers, magazines, we still do have a lot of foreign stock photography. Rahim? Are you there, Rahim, to respond um, to... So there's there's two different products. Sorry, I was just trying to get my mic unmuted. Uh, I think there are two different sites that are available for stock photography, apart from contracting local photographers directly. Um, there is uh, There used to be something called Picha Stock. I don't know if it's still available. And there's a site called Picha. Uh, I, think dot, I think it's Picha.com now. Um, it should be picha.com. Picha stock, sorry. Picha stock. And uh, there, I'm actually contributing to that. I'm really bad with names. Uh, I'm contributing to Picha stock myself. And it is actually not a local resource, but an international, I mean, a pan African resource. And it represents a lot of the African photographers who are doing stock photography. So Picha stock, you will be able to find a lot of localized, Africanized stock photography that's available to you. So it is already accessible. I think that there's quite a large library now. Um, when it started approximately two years ago, there wasn't that much. Um, I have some general stuff on that. I haven't really worked very, very, very much on developing my own uh, stock library there, but it is accessible, it's available, and this the, the quality is maintained quite high. So you expect to find good high resolution and high quality images there. Thank you, I'll check it out. I'll no worries. Yeah. Okay. Um, Asante, uh, Genevieve, Asante, Rahim. Uh, just to add, also we have, uh, I don't know if Rahim, you mentioned Pichaduka, which is run by Mwangi Kirubi, aka Mwav. I forgot uh, that one. Yes, and uh, there is also, uh, there are a few other, I think um, there's one that is run by, uh, from Panaito Studio also uh, with local pictures. So, I think to sum up, we have Samia Kamali on YouTube saying there was a German photographer who once said, editing your photos is like killing an unborn baby. I guess that is similar to no preservative. So um, I think we have had quite a very enlightening moment. Uh, Dr. Muiti, Rahim Kara, Genevieve Awino, we appreciate and those who have been following online Asante Nisana. This is just the first session of six days of a very in-depth learning at different levels. So we are gonna take a break now. Um, we will be back at two o'clock where Patrick Pato 
some of us from PAK know him as Murasta. He will be moderating the session on the dynamics of business of photography. And we will be having uh, David Masharia from Versatile. We'll be having Daudi Pwaniki from Awesome Studio and Lucy Favier, who recently shot the Olympics team uh, pictures uh, from Favier Productions sitting on the panel. So let's take our break. Guys, see you at two o'clock as Anteni Sana and goodbye. You guys, thank you. Bye. Record.